welcome Roy. Hi everyone. So today we're going to talk about silver bullets in Swift. That's a silver bullet. Um, so when we talk about silver bullets, basically it comes from the horror films of the 20s. And if you're out there fighting monsters, a silver bullet is your best weapon because it can kill werewolves and can kill vampires. And when we talk about silver bullets in programming, we're kind of talking about the same thing. We're talking about this quest that we have to find the one tool or, frame, or framework or concept that will solve all of our problems, that will make our codes clean and easy to refactor, easy to maintain, and our users happy, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I think the story will be familiar to most of you. So basically, you find this awesome article on Medium, or you go to a cool conference in Switzerland, and someone presents an idea that, you, uh, that is new to you, that, that uh, you kind of realize that you've been doing things wrong all this time, and you can't wait to, to put it in practice. So you get super, super excited. And uh, come Wednesday, you go back to the office, you open up Xcode, and, and you want to implement it as soon as possible. And you do. And then time passes. And at some point, you realize that there were some edge cases that were not mentioned in the blog post or the talk, or that your, your project is special in some, some way that you didn't really think about. And in this scenario, at some point, you realize that you've actually, that it was a mistake, and that you added some tech debt, and you need to do some refactoring. This is a refactoring place. And this kind of cycle is something that I noticed a lot of us fall into. And uh, I kept wondering why. And I don't think it's a question of experience. I've seen it happen to junior developers, to very senior developers. Um, and I think it's actually a lot about hype. So we chose this career because we, we want to build the future and we're excited about the future. And it's natural that we'll get ex uh, excited about things that we think can accelerate that vision. Um, but when I'm talking about hype, there's also like this trademarked idea of hype. Uh, so Gartner is a research firm, and they produce reports for investors. And they, they coined the hype curve, which looks like this, and it's trademarked. And uh, the hype curve is a way to describe the life cycle of a new technology. So technologies often start with a trigger. We reach a peak of inflated expectations when people are really excited about it. Then people get a bit disappointed, so we fall to a trough of disillusionment. Uh, and then kind of learn how to use it through a slope of enlightenment and reach a plateau of productivity. So if you think about this, uh, I guess self-driving cars are in the peak of inflated expectations, and desktop computing is in the, in the plateau of productivity. And I think this is very much true for frameworks and concepts in programming. And wouldn't it be great if we can shorten that time period between the peak of inflated expectations and the plateau of productivity? Because that bit is really costly, and that's where we write bad code. And this is kind of what this talk is about. So the way we're going to do this is I will talk you through three very trendy ideas in Swift. Uh, I'll explain a bit about what they are, but that's not really the point. And then I'll share some learnings about using them in production and maybe some takeaways that you can take when approaching new technologies that, that will come in the future. So the first thing I want to talk about is protocol-oriented programming. Uh, so in the last year, I attended and spoken about 10 conferences around Europe, and pretty much everyone had a talk that mentioned this in, in some way or another. And the big buzzword is that, that it's composition over inheritance. And as someone who grew up with playing Legos, that's a really like, nice idea. I like, I like the idea that my objects can just be like blocks put together. And um, yeah, it was kind of introduced in this uh, WWDC talk where we met Krusty in 2015. And Apple really sold it as a silver bullet, as something that, that will change the way you write Swift code forever and make everything better. Um, it's often explained with cars, but we're in Switzerland, so I tried to do like a, a Swiss explanation. Um, so we'll start with cheese. <laughs> uh, so in an object-oriented world, we'll have a cheese class, and it implements cheesy functions, so you can purchase cheese, fondue the cheese, obviously, and eat it. Um, and this is fine, so we have our Swiss cheeses, we have Gruyere and Raclette, and they're all subclass from this big cheese superclass. But the problem comes when you have Swiss watches, and, and purchasing a watch is very much like pur purchasing cheese, uh, like different prices, but, but the same kind of action. And uh, if we want, we can't just pick and mix functions, and that's kind of what protocol-oriented programming is there to solve. So this means that we often end up with big superclasses and, and some kind of code duplication. So in the protocol-oriented example, we'll have purchasable, fundable, and edible protocols. We can have default implementations of those in Swift, and then just describe our classes as, as a combination of, of these protocols. 
And this allows us to describe all sorts of Swiss things. So we have Gruyere, we have watches, chocolate is from Doable as well. Um, we have mock cheese, if you want to do mocking. Uh, so this is, this is kind of useful stuff. So why is it not a silver bullet? Basically, I think it comes down to the fact that if you have a hammer, um, yeah, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And I think it's true, like, especially if it's a hammer that you love using. And I think like, as a community, we kind of fell in love with this idea a bit too much. So if you look online, you'll see blog posts saying, like, if you're subclassing, you're doing it wrong. And uh, if you search on GitHub, there are 180 Swift frameworks that sell themselves as protocol oriented. And um, basically, the way we're going to do this, I'm going to do uh, like these story times of sharing experiences. And uh, after attending my first conference talk, and my first conference that I've been to, there was, there was a talk where um, the presenter did some live coding. And he basically abstracted away uh, all of the boilerplate that comes with table views into this uh, protocol-based pattern with adapters. And in the end, he just has, like, had like, very, very small structs that were driving very sort of deep uh, table view hierarchies. And it completely blew me away. And I thought, I've been doing table views all wrong. And, and I came back to the office. And actually, we're working on a new view. And the new view had a, a collection view uh, that was a bit unique. So it had like a very, very custom layout, very custom way of updating. But I thought, like, yes, this is my chance to implement the, the cool pattern that I saw. And on the surface, it was a success. So like within a day, I had it working. Table views are very close to collection views. Uh, and yeah, the, the collection view was only using a very, very small struct to update all of its data, to control all of its data. But a few months later, I started seeing that like, no one else in the team wanted to touch this class because they had no idea what was going on there. And when people asked me why did I do this complex pattern, I had no other reason to explain it apart from the fact that it made me feel cool and that, that it was exciting. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of the problem with these trendy ideas, that, that like, using them makes you feel cool. And, uh, you really, and there wasn't really like a composable, reusable use case for this, because it was such a unique collection of you. So this is another kind of popular misuse of protocol-oriented programming. Is I think it's uh, using it for, to describe data. Uh, and again, it's not about composing and reusing. It's just using protocols because you like using protocols. Um, so I think like, the technical learnings from this, that, that protocol-oriented programming is awesome for composable, reusable behavior. Uh, it's not so awesome for describing data or things that are not reusable and that you just do to, to feel better. Uh, but the sort of bigger lesson for this, and I think, is to start simple. And, and unlike that, if you're subclassing, you're doing a wrong uh, title, I think like actually starting with the simplest implementation and then seeing if there's a need for the cool new tech to, or the, the cool new concept to be applied there, um, I think that's a much, much safer way to go. The second thing I want to talk about is uh, functional reactive programming which is also very, very trendy. Um, so we have two popular frameworks in iOS. We have RxSwift and Reactive Cocoa. We will talk a bit more about RxSwift. And the big buzzword here is that it's declarative and everything is a stream, and that your app will become a function of its state. So again, this is kind of a very seductive idea. So if I'm trying to visualize the apps that I've worked on, it's often like a, a complex set of machines that somehow produce UI. And, and thinking of it as kind of like this river of information that you just see snapshots of, um, that's, that's a really nice thought. And I think like maybe that will make my code easier to understand and, 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 less, and with fewer bugs and fewer problems. So when Rx works well, this is kind of the, the dream. Uh, you get like, very, uh, like a very small amount of code doing quite a lot of stuff. So this is like email validation. Um, and yeah, all you, all you need to see here is that it's, it's very short. And uh, the other selling point is that Rx Swift exists in, in uh, a family of Rx solutions. So we have Rx Java as well. And in theory, you could share some of these manipulations of data across the different um, cross platform. So this is not a silver bullet either. And there's a story time here as well. So in a previous company, uh, we had a problem where there wasn't much parity in the business logic between the Android and iOS app. And we thought Rx could be a good solution for that. And also, uh, we had some issues. We had a lot of data being produced. And, and uh, the way it was kind of propagated in the, in the app was through KVO. And KVO, it's very hard to batch data. And, and this is something that Rx does quite well. So at some point, higher up, the decision was done that we were going to actually rewrite the app and use Rx all the way from the networking to the UI. And when you do this kind of exercise, you realize that there's actually quite a steep learning curve with Rx. Um, like the basic concepts are easy to understand, but like to really master it, uh, talking to other developers, I think it takes about like three weeks to a month. And if you look at Amazon, there are like 
almost 24,000 functional programming books. Uh, Rx Swift, there's, there's one book that's uh, written by one of the organizers of this talk. Um, but yeah, you need, you need these books and you need these experiences and, and it takes time. Uh, but say you've spent this time and you're an Rx master, you can write code like this. But then the problem is that everyone that's joining your team, especially if you're in a company that's growing, uh, will have to go through that same process in order for them to be productive and to be able to, to write code and debug this kind of thing. Um, the other big issue that we encountered was UIKit. So like this declarative future sounds really nice, but UIKit is not really on board. Um, basically, Rx Swift comes with these uh, libraries, Rx Cocoa and Rx Data Sources that kind of try to massage UIKit in that direction. Uh, but if you're trying to do anything that's sort of not very standard, or if you have sort of rich animations, uh, UIK will have like its revenge in, in like bad moments. Um, this is actually a visualization of from Rx Java of an Rx Java calculator app, <laughs> and you can see like all the streams going on in there. Um, if you've ever written an app with KVO, you know how hard it is to debug sometimes, and Rx is like that on steroids. Uh, when you're programming, there are tools that will help you, but when your app is out there in the wild and you're getting crash reports or stack traces, it's really, really hard to know what happened. So the result of this exercise was we, d we didn't really manage to get this kind of parity between the iOS and Android because they're, they're still very different platforms. Um, and there were sort of new bugs that, that came from, from Rx and from uh, us trying to understand how to use it. And in the end, there was, had to be some refactoring and sort of scaling back and not going all the way to the UI and kind of stopping one step short and letting UI get do the rest. Uh, and that cost, cost, a lot, cost us a lot of time and effort. So I think the Rx experience that I had, I think Rx is awesome for simplifying data flows and for batching and uh, doing complicated things with data. Uh, but once you have a lot of complexity in your app, especially in the UI, and you expect to onboard a lot of people, that, that's when it becomes quite painful. And I think the lesson here is that if you're in a leadership position, like you should not force new tech on, on your company. And, and especially not with a scope as big as like rewriting the whole app. It's if you treat a new tech as something that's not a silver bullet and your uh, mission is sort of to discover the limitations as quickly and as cheaply as possible, uh, it's better to do it on a much smaller and sort of safer scale. And the other thing that I think is important here is to consider future debt. So I have friends who work for a company that, that went all in on Reactive Cocoa. And now that it's kind of fallen out of favor, they're, they're trying to rewrite it out of, of the app. And that's really, really difficult because that, that drove pretty much every interaction. And it's taken them the best part of a year and it's, it's still not finished. The last thing I want to talk about, which I guess is kind of controversial, is Swift itself. So Swift was sold, like the, the buzzwords, it's the Objective C without the C. That sounds quite nice as well. Uh, I love Swift. There's a lot to love about Swift. So this is just a partial list of things that I like about it. So it's type safety and it's functional-ish and it does like server. But Swift is not a silver bullet. And by that I mean that even though it's 2017 and Swift 4 is around the corner, I don't think Swift makes sense for every app today. Uh, again, story time, I was quite fortunate to work on a big production app that kind of mixed uh, Swift and Objective-C and a big sort of Swift-only production app and I have like Swift open source frameworks. And the kind of issues that you encounter, so the big one is compile times. Um, so if you have cyclical references between Objective-C and Swift and Objective-C, every time you change something, Xcode uh, invalidates its cache and that, that kind of increases <laughs> compile times in a big way. This example of code uh, takes about eight hours to compile. So like type inference is a big problem. Uh, it won't be eight hours in reality, but like uh, the worst that it got for us was about eight to nine minutes, which is still very slow. And even though it's like, it's a nice engineering exercise to try and write as much code as possible without running, uh, it really kills productivity. Um, the other big issue is this. Uh, every new year we have this tradition of, of a new version of Swift. And um, I've done the Swift 1 to 2 transition, Swift 2 to 3. Uh, again, talking to other developers, it for big code bases, it takes about like two to three weeks to do these migrations. Um, for me, the biggest issue is that unit tests uh, also break. And um, I had unit tests that passed that they shouldn't have because of the automatic uh, transition. So you really have to review all of your code, and that, that takes quite, quite a bit of time. Um, the other big issue is, again, if you're working with a lot of other people, uh, modularizing your code base is a great way to avoid uh, conflicts. 
Uh, Swift doesn't support static linking, so it's only dynamic linking, and Apple say that you shouldn't have more than six. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's really hard to do. And uh, if you have more than six dynamic frameworks, the app launch time increases quite significantly, and that, that ruins the experience. Um, the other issue is binary size. So this is from uh, the Uber app, which is now 170 megabytes for, for not doing that much. Uh, and that's Swift. <laughs> Uh, so I think Swift is, is really awesome for new projects, for, definitely for side projects, open source. Uh, I think it's great for learning because it's, it's still, it is the future uh, and we're, it's kind of like the, um, we're at a time when you can really influence the, the development of Swift. And uh, it's really fun, it's a fun language. Uh, but I think if your project has a lot of constraints, especially uh, with time, if you can like, afford to do these migrations every year or the number of people who work on the project, um, this is something that you need to consider before, before moving to Swift. So yeah, fully consider the constraints of your projects, but not just in the sort of short term, but have a sort of a longer term outlook. I think that's, that's a lesson here. So the message of this talk, um, I will show it again, is that no, it's not that you should not try new things, because I think that's kind of the danger in this kind of talk. Um, I think we're actually very fortunate that, that we work in a field where there are a lot of new solutions coming out all the time, and it's really, really exciting. Uh, and it's what makes it fun. But it's more that we should not just do things uh, because they're trendy. And we should uh, really not look at a new technology looking for a silver bullet. Uh, like I said, it's, it's about finding these limitations as quickly as you can, uh, but, but, not, but sort of being more careful in production apps. And it's about solving your problem, which I know is something that a lot of people say, and it's, it's really hard to do, because a lot of the limitations that I showed you are things that you discover when you put these things into practice. So I wanted to give sort of more practical ideas about how to do this. And I think like hack days and hackathons and side projects are a great way to experiment without the pressure, of, of, on this, without the risk of doing it in, in a production app. But actually more of these story times, I think, are the, are the real solution. Um, as a community, we're very good at being excited and, and sharing this excitement about new things, but we're not so good about sharing learnings that we arrive at for experience. And we do get excited about the same thing, so if we can learn from each other, uh, we can minimize this time that it takes us to reach the plateau of productivity. And again, this is not a silver bullet, so if you have more ideas, come and talk to me. Um, so I wanted to end on like this hopeful note and with a Steve Jobs quote about staying hungry and staying foolish and being excited, uh, but, but not go looking for silver bullets. Uh, thank you.